Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is the fifth episode of season four. We're halfway through the season already dear listeners. I have a feeling this episode it might be a touch longer than my usual 15 to 30 minute duration but believe me it'll be worth listening right up until the end. Last week's episode was pretty short and this week definitely makes up for that. As always, let's firstly start with this. Welcome to Daddy Facts. As you just heard, this segment is called Daddy Facts or Dad Facts and it involves me reading out a random dad fact from a pack of cards my daughter got me a few years ago. I know hardly any of them, make of that what you will, but nevertheless, here is this week's fact, ready and prepared. To get clean, sparkling headlights, rub with toothpaste and rinse with clean water. Good tip. You wouldn't have a car in the jungle. We're yet to find a fact that would save us on a desert island, for example. But never mind. We will find one. I'm confident there's one in there. We just haven't got it yet. With that done, let's now move on to the second and final opening icebreaker segment of the show. The Serial Killer's Book of Haiku. Here is this week's haiku. Spade scuffs into dirt. Clang, clang of rock echoes in the wood. Corpse dragged. Now that one goes across sort of two lines there. So Rose, I'm probably reading that wrong. There's a nice image there of the woods, which is quite apt for this episode. A haiku, by the way, is a Japanese poem made up of 17 syllables in three lines of five, seven, and five. And it's meant to be read in one breath. That's why I take a a massive deep breath before I read it. And the book I get these from is called The Serial Killer's Book of Haiku by Rose Bundy. There is a link in my bio if you're interested in buying it. But without further ado, let's get into this week's episode. We're not messing around this week. We do have a lot to get through. This case was suggested by listener Freya Elford. Freya got in touch with me via Instagram in September with a case suggestion that she has a personal connection with as it took place in her hometown. As with all case suggestions, I add the case to my episode list, and here we are. As a reminder, this fourth season is made up entirely of listener-suggested cases, so if you want me to cover a case and get a shout-out, please do get in touch. I've also started to fill up Season 5's episode list with listener suggestions, so please keep them coming in if you want yours to be featured sooner rather than later. As always, let's start with a look at the area where this story takes place. This week, we're in the railway town of Didcot, which is located in the southeast county of Oxfordshire. Now, before doing my research, I asked case suggester Freya Elford for some facts, seeing as though Didcot is her hometown. She gave me a few. Apparently, in 2017, researchers named Didcot as the most normal town in England. That's an actual thing, by the way. Look it up. If you want to know the top five normal towns, I know you love this kind of shite. Here is the list. One is obviously Didcot in Oxfordshire. Two is Droitwich Spa in Worcestershire. Three is Bath Road area, the general area in Worcester. Four is Southwick in West Sussex. And five is East Leek in Nottinghamshire. So nothing really above the Midlands there. Nothing up north. Yeah, we're not normal up here. Didcot is also known for its natural gas power station that supplies the UK's national grid. The Didcot A plant was closed in 2013 and its gradual demolition took place over the following years. In the afternoon of February 23rd, 2016, part of Didcot A's boiler house collapsed while an external demolition contractor was working in it. The contractor was confirmed dead and another three were pronounced as missing, presumed dead. Five further individuals were treated at John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford after the accident and around 50 further people were treated at the scene for dust inhalation. With the random location facts portion of the show out of the way, we'll now take a look at this week's villain. The word villain, it doesn't really do this guy justice, by the way. This episode does focus heavily on domestic abuse, and I'll be graphically describing examples of what went on, so as ever, feel free to tune out if that sort of content is likely to upset you. Ben Blakely is the name of our villain. He grew up in the university area of Reading, and as an adult, his job was that of a bin man, or a garbage man, if you're listening across the pond in the US. I think the PC term is waste collector these days, but we still refer to them as bin men here. 
As is usually the case, I couldn't find out Ben's specific date of birth, but working backwards like the amateur detective I think I am, but I'm clearly not, he appears to have been born in 1992, so three years younger than me. Ben's apparent vendetta against members of the opposite sex appears to have started at school, or at least that's the earliest information available out there. He was described by one of his fellow pupils as being very intimidating and evil. That's a strong word for a school kid. Kaylee Sellers, who used to live near Ben's family in Reading, said that she was once threatened by him whilst walking down the street one day. This was when Ben was in his early teen years, so it will have been 13, 14. As she walked past Ben and his group of friends, Kaylee was stopped in her tracks when he pulled out a penknife from his pocket and started pointing at her. Kaylee was let go with no harm done, no physical harm anyway, but she was one of the lucky ones. By the time Ben turned 15, he'd started a relationship with a 16-year-old girl named Kirsty Penford. It was April 2007 when the pair started dating, and it wasn't long before things turned sour. Ben was violent towards Kirsty and immensely controlling. He would only allow her to wear makeup to cover the bruises on her face that had been caused by him hitting her. Within a few months of becoming an item, Kirsty fell pregnant. They were both very young, so it must have been an extremely difficult thing to come to terms with, but Ben's reaction to the news was far worse than, say, simply being distraught. At first, Ben went down the denial route and refused to admit that the baby was even his. He also accused Kirsty of being unfaithful to him, which simply wasn't true. What's worse, though, and this is quite hard to hear, so prepare yourselves, when Kirsty was seven months pregnant, Ben threw her down the stairs of an apartment building. And he threatened to stab her in the stomach in order to kill the baby, an almost fully developed baby. As a father, that just turns my stomach. When the baby was finally born, unharmed, thankfully, in 2008, Ben was raging and still hadn't come to terms with his new life situation. The day after the birth, Ben stormed into the maternity wing of the hospital, located the area where Kirsty and the baby were, and started to wheel the baby away inside the cot. The police were called and it turned up pretty quick, thankfully. They took the baby, returned it to Kirsty, and then Ben was led away from the hospital. They ended their relationship not long after that. I assume the baby remained with Kirsty, but it wasn't long before he'd found someone else to bully and control. In 2009, a 17-year-old Ben started dating 16-year-old Katie Gale. According to Katie, the first year of their relationship was absolute bliss. Maybe bliss is a bit too much of a strong word, but it was nothing out of the ordinary. It was normal. No violence, no abuse, no control, nothing. Not bliss, just ordinary. The bizarre thing is that when they got together, Ben told Katie that he could be possessive, controlling, and jealous. Red flag alert or what? Their seemingly perfect relationship deteriorated, however, in 2010, at a party that Ben had organised at his house. He accused Katie of flirting with one of the other boys at the party, and he snapped. He ended the party abruptly and kicked everyone out, including Katie. The next day, Katie went back to Ben's house to, I assume, make up, but rather than greeting his partner with a smile and a hug, Ben, who'd been drinking that morning, spat at her instead. That was followed by some verbal abuse. He called her a slag. He said, if you didn't leave right now, I'm going to kick you out, but not before I strip you down naked. Yep, you heard that right. He threatened to kick her out of his house with nothing on, unless she left immediately. After that incident, Ben's true side came out. During their three years together, Ben allegedly strangled Katie at least ten times, punched her all over, kicked her in the head, and he even bit her on the face. When he bit her, he made sure to cling on to her cheeks in order to leave marks. Why did he do all that? To teach her a lesson. Well, that was the reason that Katie provided. She said, he did it because I did something wrong. On one occasion, I walked home a different route and got there later, and he accused me of cheating and hit me. It was to teach me a lesson. Katie would tell people that the bite marks were love bites. There's no way anyone believed her, surely, on your cheeks. Maybe on the neck, but yeah, I don't think people were buying that. If all that wasn't extreme enough, Ben once threatened to cut Katie up in the bath. She went to visit him one day in August 2012 because he'd stolen some money from her. What he'd done was taken her phone, which he did a lot, as well as a debit card. 
Now, because he was so controlling, he knew her PIN number. He knew everything. Phone, taken. Knew your PIN. I've got your debit card. He withdrew £100 from a cash machine. It's unclear whether Katie went round to confront him about that, but regardless of why she went round, Ben started attacking her as soon as she walked through the door. He repeatedly punched her, kicked her, he used both his hands to strangle her, and it was whilst he was strangling her that he said he was going to cut her up in the bath. Katie obviously thought she was going to die. It must have been absolutely terrifying. After Ben had relinquished his grip on Katie's neck and her blood vessels had settled back down on her face, he calmly told her to take all her clothes off and go to bed. I mean, talk about Jekyll and Hyde. He went from death threats and strangulation to pretending that nothing had even happened and they just went to bed together. The next day, thankful to still be alive, Katie left Ben's house wearing nothing but a dressing gown. Probably another twisted power move from Ben. You'll be happy to hear that Katie decided to report Ben's assault to the police, but she ended up not logging a formal complaint or pressing charges against him. Blinded by what she thought was love and no doubt fear, Katie said, I didn't want to get him into trouble. I loved him. He would get arrested and he would hurt me. It's heartbreaking to hear victims of domestic violence say things like that, but it's only because they're so fearful of their abusers and they're basically trauma bonded to them. Look up trauma bonding if you get a spare five minutes, by the way, it's absolutely awful. At one point, Ben told Katie that he'd stabbed one of her cats to death after it went missing, but that claim was never substantiated. The irony of the whole thing with Ben and his control was that he abused Katie if she even looked at another boy, yet Ben was actively cheating on her with another girl named Sarah Rees. Katie discovered a photo of the pair together and sent it to Ben with the caption, Busted, underneath. She finally managed to get out of a toxic relationship with Ben in October 2012. She said she stayed with him so long because she loved him. It wasn't love, Katie. It was just fear and a trauma bond. When it came to Ben and Sarah's relationship, you won't be surprised to hear that nothing changed with his behaviour. Sarah, who was a similar age to the then 20-year-old Ben, claimed that their relationship started in August 2012. So that's a couple of months before Ben and Katie officially separated and it lasted just over a year until November 2013. The pair had a bit of history, they'd gone out briefly a few years earlier, but this time they were in a proper relationship. I say proper relationship, I mean as opposed to like dating. They'd known each other for years, even since primary school, but again, Sarah described her new partner as controlling, intimidating, and scary. Not qualities you look for in a new partner, typically. The same controlling behaviour and rules were put in place with her. She wasn't allowed to talk to anyone else. She wasn't allowed to meet anyone else. She was forced to change her phone number twice. And death threats soon came her way with regards to if she ever cheated on Ben. On one occasion, Sarah tried to end the relationship over message. Ben then phoned her and said if she no longer wanted to be with him, he'd physically hurt her family. With regards to the new phone number thing, Ben hated people from Sarah's past messaging her. He once snapped her SIM card in half after seeing that she'd received a text from someone. Sarah quit all social media, had to hand her phone over regularly so that Ben could check her activity and see who she was talking to. She also had to wait on him hand and foot by cooking him meals at the snap of his fingers. The violence suffered by Sarah was similar to the girls that came before her. She was punched, kicked, smacked in the ribs, held against the wall by her neck, and even told by Ben that he would burn the house down if she tried to leave him, which she attempted to do on several occasions. Our timeline is now in November 2013, when Sarah and Ben finally split up. It's time to introduce a young girl called Jaden Parkinson. Jaden, who I believe was born in 1996, grew up in the port town of Folkestone in Kent. She didn't have the best of childhoods, and her parents split up after the family moved to Oxford. A long two-year custody battle ensued when Samantha and Paul Parkinson, Jaden's parents, separated, and she initially moved up to Manchester with her dad. At the age of 13, Jaden decided to move back down to Oxford to live with her mum. It was there that Jaden's behaviour drastically deteriorated. She was constantly excluded from high school due to rarely turning up, she often ran away from home for days on end. When she was 17, which brings us back to 2013, social services finally stepped in and tried to help the troubled youngster, 
by moving her to a hostel in Oxford named One Foot Forward. According to journalist Pete Hughes, One Foot Forward was a place which had a bad reputation in Oxford. He said, When Jaden was there, it was a place people of already troubled backgrounds were staying. Bringing elements of their lives to that hostel that were unhelpful may have got her in trouble and may have made her situation worse than it was before. Bringing the story back on track, Jaden met Ben when she was going through a most troubling period at the age of 15. They didn't start dating until a year later though. Timeline wise, that means that Ben was seeing Jaden whilst in a relationship, if we can even call it that, with Sarah Rees. Sadly, Jaden also fell victim to Ben's cruel behaviour. He was controlling, constantly took her phone off her, he physically abused her, and it probably comes as no shock to hear that he strangled her on occasion as well. Ben decided what she could and couldn't wear, which led to Jaden dressing in baggy clothes that covered her entire body, whilst not being allowed to even wear makeup. The only exception, of course, was to cover up the bruises on her face, as with Ben's previous girlfriends. The usually extroverted Jaden had become a shell of her former self, and was described as being timid after getting together with Ben. One of the support workers at the One Foot Forward Hostel in Oxford provided even more insight into the daily hell of Jaden's life whilst with Ben. Hannah Ryan, who worked at the hostel, explained that Ben took advantage of Jaden's timid nature and the youngster was essentially kept as a prisoner in her own room. Ben would not allow her to leave her room even if she wanted a shower or needed to use the toilet. I'm sure actual prisoners get treated better than that. Left with no friends and ultimately no life, Jaden decided that she needed to form a plan to escape her living hell. Jaden tried to leave Ben a few times and she was knocked back, but she persisted and they finally separated on November 21st, 2013. Hannah Ryan recalls seeing Jaden a few days later on November 24th and noted how happy she seemed. It's probably a case of having such a large weight lifted from her back. That feeling of elation didn't last long though, as Jaden soon discovered she was pregnant with Ben's baby. Deja vu, anyone? After going full no contact with Ben after leaving him, Jaden was forced to reconnect with him after finding out about the pregnancy. As you'd expect, Jaden gave Ben a call to let him know the situation. Side note, Jaden had to make the call from one of the hostel's phones because Ben had taken hers off her. If you're expecting Ben to have changed his ways by this point and to have been buzzing upon hearing Jaden's news, you're very, very wrong. As he had with Kirsty Penford, Ben denied he was the father, obviously. He then went one step further and threatened to post a load of naked pictures of Jaden online, which he'd taken, without her consent, on his own phone. I'm not sure how it went from denying being the father of the child to threatening to post naked photos online, but you can imagine Jaden, 17-year-old girl, she took that threat extremely seriously, as you would, as you should. She did report Ben's threat to the police on November 27th, 2013, but nothing seems to have come of it. I suppose it was just an idle threat still at that point. In a statement, Jaden said, I'm terrified he might send them everywhere. The following Tuesday, which was December 3rd, 2013, Jaden had plans to visit Ben to discuss the pregnancy. Leaving the One Foot Forward hostel at 3.41pm, Jaden soon met up with Ben and the pair were spotted on CCTV at Oxford Railway Station going through the turnstiles. The pair were also seen arriving at their destination, Didcot Parkway Railway Station. That was the last time Jaden Parkinson was seen alive. Later that evening, Blakely was seen returning to Didcot train station, only this time he was alone. As I said earlier, Jaden was known to disappear from home for a few days every now and then, but she always made contact with her family and eventually returned home. On this occasion, a full week soon passed without her family receiving any contact from her. It was at that point that Jaden's family called the police, and Oxfordshire's major crime unit were brought in to work the case. Detective Chief Superintendent Chris Ward led the case, and said the following in relation to the steps taken by the major crime unit. We got involved after Jaden had been missing for just over a week. I looked back over the circumstances of her disappearance and the fact she had no contact whatsoever with her family, which was unusual. I asked the police officers on the investigation to start going through the proof of life checklist. Things such as financial records, use of social media, use of technology, mobile phone use. This checklist derives from the fact it is virtually impossible for an adult to go missing without leaving any trace of their existence if they are alive. 
Unable to find any sign that Jaden was still alive after the last sighting of her at Didcot train station, we quickly began to believe that she had been murdered, and the search turned to finding her body. I know that's a wordy statement to read out word for word, but hearing about the police's processes is fascinating to me. Ben was arrested on suspicion of Jaden's murder shortly after her disappearance, though obviously he denied killing her. Samantha, Jaden's mum, recalled how the police went to see her at her home to inform her that they had arrested Ben, but that they were yet to find a body. DCS Ward explained that a taxi driver came forward after hearing of Ben's arrest and recognising his face. The taxi driver recalled a fare on December 3rd in which the customer, a young adult male, entered the vehicle with a suitcase. He gave a sob story about how his partner had kicked him out and that all of his most prized possessions were inside the suitcase. That comment didn't sit right with the taxi driver though. There were no houses anywhere near the country road where he'd collected him. Despite booking the taxi using a fake name, the major crime unit were able to establish that the booking call had been made from Ben's mobile. A search then began in the area surrounding a deserted barn which had been pointed out to them by the taxi driver. Sniffer dogs were placed on the scene, and it wasn't long before they detected the scent of a body on a discarded serviette in a nearby field. It was clear to the dogs that a body had been recently present in the barn. House-to-house -house inquiries were then made in Didcot and the areas where Ben's family lives. DCS Ward said, One of the houses they knocked on was the grandmother of Ben and his brother Jake. She said that Ben had come into a house a few days before, very agitated, saying he needed a suitcase. He took her suitcase, after having emptied the contents on the floor. He came back a few hours later and dumped that suitcase in her shed, and it was covered in mud. How convoluted is this story, by the way? I hope you're still following along. Bringing it back to Ben's grandma, the police found two spades at her house. Why was that a significant find? The spades were covered in the same thick mud that was on the suitcase Ben dumped in her shed. The next breakthrough in the search came when the police were contacted by a homeowner who had been subletting a room out to Ben's 17-year-old brother, Jake Blakely. Jake had allegedly told the lady who called the police that he had discarded some clothes for his brother. That led to Jake's arrest, but like his brother, his lips were sealed and he admitted to nothing. So far then, we have a muddy suitcase, two spades covered in mud, and Jake confessing to getting rid of some clothes. Based on that, what do you think happened? I think it's fair to say you probably think exactly what the police did. They suspected the brothers of killing Jaden and then burying her body. The Royal Air Force were then commissioned to fly over the search area and take some aerial photographs. The photographs were then sent to a forensic archaeologist who spotted some foot patterns around one of the graves in the cemetery at All Saints Church. Ready for a plot twist? It wasn't just a random grave. It belonged to Alan Kennedy. Who's Alan Kennedy? The uncle of Ben Blakely. The cemetery was cordoned off by the police on December 17th, 2013, so that's a full two weeks after Jaden was last seen alive on December 3rd. The exhumation of Alan Kennedy's grave was led by forensic archaeologist Dr. Carl Harrison. He said, You'd expect a grave that had been occupied for some years to be grassed over, but in this instance, it had clods of soil on the top, as if it had been recently excavated. There were green leaves that were mixed in with the fill, which gave us confidence that it had been disturbed recently. Anything green that had fallen in there when the uncle was buried would have long decomposed. There were also tool marks present in the side of the grave, extremely crisp and fresh, extremely deep, which looked like they'd been delivered with high energy. At a depth of around 40 centimetres, the fill of the soil became looser, and then we could see the skin of a visible body. It belonged to Jaden Parkinson. I really can't get over that part of the story, by the way. Jaden's body was found buried inside Ben's uncle's grave. You can't make this shit up. After removing Jaden's body, a post-mortem was conducted, and the pathologist confirmed that her cause of death was asphyxiation due to strangulation. Ben was then formally charged with Jaden's murder, and the trial began on June 20th, 2014. A quick side note, Jaden's father, Paul, died on June 12th, 2014, eight days before the trial started. He travelled down to Oxford for the trial, but he unfortunately suffered a fatal heart attack, which his relatives attributed to the stress caused by the murder of his beloved daughter. 
The chain of events that led up to Jaden's death was summarised in court, and it's basically thus. The pair met up on December 3rd and got the train to Didcot. Ben then denied that Jaden's baby was his. He accused her of cheating on him. He strangled her, as he had done before, but this time she didn't survive. Ben initially hid her body in the field near the barn. He returned a few days later with the suitcase from his grandma's, and he placed Jaden's body inside of it. He then phoned a taxi using a fake name. He was dropped off at All Saints Church, and he proceeded to bury Jaden's body in the grave of his uncle Alan Kennedy. Interestingly, this is the first case in Britain where a murder victim has been buried in a pre-existing grave. Ben said in court that he grabbed Jaden around the throat with both hands and thought she was joking when she fell to the ground. He therefore admitted to killing Jaden, but only by way of manslaughter rather than murder. Three of Ben's former girlfriends gave evidence during the trial, and they each said that he was not only physically abusive, but that he had a sick and twisted mind. On July 24th, 2014, the jury returned with their final verdict to Oxford Crown Court. Ben Blakely was found guilty of the murder of Jaden Parkinson by a majority verdict of 11 to 1 and sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term to serve of 20 years. I'd love to know what that one person's logic was behind not considering this to be murder. Sentencing judge Patrick Eccles QC said this in his closing statement. It required a heart of stone to keep up that pretense and a heart of stone to deal with her body in the way that you did. In your twisted mind, you may possibly have thought that a graveyard was a better place for Jaden to be buried than a ditch in a field. There was no hint of respect or remorse in this hasty intimate, and I am convinced that your primary purpose was to prevent anyone else from ever knowing what had happened to Jaden Parkinson. In June 2015, Ben Blakely was handed a further sentence of eight months in prison to be served concurrently with his life sentence for the murder of Jaden. This latest sentence came on the back of an assault committed by Ben against Hayden Cannon on October 22nd, 2013. That was about six weeks before Jaden's murder. The incident first started on a train between Reading and Didcot late in the evening of October 22nd, and it appears to have started when Hayden confronted Ben. A heated argument ensued, which spilled out onto the platform at Didcot Station, which ended when Ben picked up a discarded glass bottle, whacked Hayden over the head with it, and continuously kicked him as he lay defenceless on the ground. The story doesn't end there, though. In August 2015, three Thames Valley police officers, as well as a member of staff, were set to face misconduct proceedings following the investigation into Jaden's disappearance. The Independent Police Complaints Commission had the case referred to them by Thames Valley Police on December 14th, 2013, and they carried out an investigation into the force's response to Jaden's disappearance. On September 25th, 2015, the first misconduct meeting was held and it was found that the member of staff had no case to answer. On October 2nd, 2015, two of the three police officers received final written warnings following their conduct during the missing person investigation and the third officer, they received a written warning. But what about Jake Blakely, I hear you ask? What happened to him? Let me tell you, dear listener. Jake Blakely, so this is Ben's brother, he was jailed on March 10th, 2015, and sentenced to three years in prison for perverting the course of justice. Amazingly, despite helping Ben hide Jaden's body, Jake was acquitted of that. He said during his trial that he believed he was burying weapons, a dead dog, and a dead cat. His story was clearly thought to be true, and he was instead charged due to all the lies he told about Jaden's possible whereabouts when he was questioned by the police, keeping his mouth shut basically led to him being prosecuted. Detective Inspector Craig Kirby said, Jake Blakely was sentenced having previously pleaded guilty to perverting the course of justice on a basis of plea, that he knew he was helping his brother to conceal a criminal act, but that he did not know he was helping to bury Jaden Parkinson's body. Whilst I am disappointed the jury were unable to reach a verdict in respect of the preventing the lawful burial charge, the hung jury demonstrates the difficulties the investigation faced in piecing together what happened on December 3rd, 2013, and over the following week. Even unwittingly, Jake assisted his brother to conceal Jaden's body after she was murdered, assistance which, in the words of his honour Judge Eccles, prolonged the agony of Jaden's family. I believe today's sentence reflects the severity of this. And that was the story of British murderer Ben Blakely.
and his helper, Jake. Thanks again to Freya Elford for suggesting that case. I've got another two new reviews to read out this week. Firstly, thank you, Bro is 21 for leaving British Murders a five-star rating and review on iTunes. They said, really engaging and an easy listen, because they aren't really long unlike some others. Cheers, bro. Thank you as well, little lad, strawberry emoji, ice cream emoji, for leaving British Murders a five-star rating and review on iTunes. They said, came here from TikTok, and it's probably the best thing social media's ever done to me. You articulate every show so well. Then there's two smiley face emojis with stars for eyes. Stars in their eyes, eh? Love it. Another listener there was found me from TikTok, which is nice. Thank you again, bro is 21 and little lad, strawberry ice cream, for your kind words. If you'd like to leave a review of the show and have it read on a future episode, you can do so on iTunes or Podchaser. All reviews help increase the show's exposure and they are, of course, greatly appreciated. Next week, I'm doing a movie review. My friend David John Brady, who is a composer, I've known him from work for years now. He actually composed the opening theme music of British Murders. We discussed 28 Days Later from 2002, directed by Danny Boyle. British horror zombie film, it's a classic. We discussed that, so that'll come out next Thursday. And then the week after, we'll get back to season four with episode six. In the meantime, for more on British Murders, please check out my social media channels as well as YouTube. Merch is available to purchase at Teespring. You can support the show on Patreon and or buy me a coffee. Please email some case suggestions to britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com or hit me up on social media. You'll not only get the episode covered, but you'll get a cheeky shout out as well. (laughs) That's it for now. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.